In this video, we are going to talk about linear independence and linear dependence. This is our overview slide, which we'll spend a few minutes going over before we get to the main part of our video, where we will go over each of these topics in more detail and with more examples. I also want to remind you these three concepts of linear combination, span, and linear independence dependence are critical. They're key for linear algebra. It's very important to get these three concepts down. We will start with a quick review of the concept of linear combination and span, which were covered in detail in our last video. So a linear combination of a set of vectors in a vector space V is vectors of the form a scalar A1 times the first vector V1 plus A2 times the second vector V2 plus up to a scalar AM times the nth vector VM. The span is the set of all linear combinations of a set of vectors in a vector space. We denote that with span and then we list our vectors. And again, the form of the span of V1, V2 up to VN will be a scalar times V1 plus a scalar times V2 plus up to a scalar times Vm. Next, we will talk about the idea of linear independence and linear dependence. So a list of vectors in a vector space V is called linearly independent if the only solution to the homogeneous equation, and homogeneous equation means it's equal to zero, so it's this linear combination of all of our list of vectors, so a1, v1, plus a2, v2, up to a, m, v, m, is set equal to zero. So if the only solution to the homogeneous equation is the trivial solution, and the trivial solution is where all the a sub i are equal to zero, then we call that linearly independent. So let me say that one more time. Linearly independent. A list of vectors is linearly independent if the only solution to the homogeneous equation is the trivial solution. And again, by trivial, we don't mean it's not important. The trivial solution in mathematics means zero. A list of vectors that is not linearly independent will be called linearly dependent. The first example we will look at is the vector 2, 3, 1, 1, negative 1, 2, and 7, 3, 8. And we are going to show they are linearly dependent. In other words, there's a non-trivial solution to the homogeneous equation. So what we do is we set up our scalar times our first vector, so a1 times 2, 3, 1. Our second scalar, a2 times our second vector, 1, negative 1, 2, plus our third scalar, a3, times our third vector, 7, 3, 8. And we set it equal to 0, 0, 0. This gives us a system of linear equations. We solve that by taking our coefficient matrix uh, concatenated with our solution, and we row reduce, and we get this matrix here. This matrix, going back to our system equations, suggests that a3 is free, a2 is equal to minus 3a1, and a1 is equal to minus 2a2 minus 8a1. One. So I chose a3 to be equal to 1, so here I have 1 times our third vector. a2 then is equal to 1 times negative 3, so a2 is going to be negative 3 times our second vector. And then a1 then will be equal to, if a3 is equal to, this should be a 3 over here, if a3 is equal to 1, a1 will be equal to negative 2. So we have our negative 2 times our first vector. If we do all the scalar multiplications and then add the resulting vectors, we will get the zero vector. And the other comment we will make is now we have a non-trivial solution, so that they are linearly dependent over here. And another way of thinking of linearly dependent is we can take any one of these three vectors, and I chose just the first one, 2, 3, 1, and we can write it as a linear combination of the other two vectors, as I have done here. And that's, this is how I think of linearly dependent, is one of the vectors you can write as a linear combination of the other vectors, and therefore one of the vectors is dependent on the others. And if you can't do this, if you can't write one of the vectors as a linear combination of the others, that means the vectors are independent. And I have this note here. If vectors are linearly dependent, 
you can write any one of the vectors as a linear combination of the others. We have this lemma that we will prove in the main part of our video. Suppose we have vectors v1, v2 up to vm, and they are linearly dependent, and they are vectors in a vector space v. Then there exists a jth vector such that, one, the jth vector is in the span of the other j minus 1 vectors, v1, v2 up to j minus 1, and if the jth term is removed from the list, so we are left with j1, j2 up to j minus 1, then the span of the remaining list equals the span of v1, v2 up to vm. So removing the jth vector will still have the same span as our original list. Another theorem we will prove and also use the results to do some problems is in a finite dimensional vector space, the length of every linearly independent list of vectors is less than or equal to the length of every spanning list of vectors. And this is our example that we will work in the main part of our video. And last, we'll have one more theorem. Every subspace of a finite dimensional vector space is finite dimensional. So that wraps up our overview. So we'll go back, do a quick review of linear combination and span. Our definition for linear combination of a list of vectors v1, v2 up to vm in a vector space v is a vector of the form scalar a1 times the first vector v1 plus scalar a2 times the second vector v2 up to scalar am times the vector vm. A typical problem will involve answering the question, is a vector such as 17, negative 4, 2, a linear combination of other vectors such as 2, 1, negative 3, and 1, negative 2, 4. If it is a linear combination, then it should be able to be written in this form, a1 times 2, 1, negative 3, plus a2, 1, negative 2, 4. Writing this out, then we'll have 17, negative 4, 2 is equal to a1, 2, 1, negative 3, plus a2, 1, negative 2, 4. So this is our matrix equation here, or maybe it's our vector equations. Matrix equation, we'll call it matrix equation. Now when we multiply out our scalar a1 times i vector, we get 2a1, a1, and minus 3a1. When we multiply a2 times i vector, we get a2 minus 2a2 and 4a2. We can add these two vectors to get 2a1 plus a2 over here. Adding these two numbers, we get a1 minus, this should actually be a2 minus 2a2, and here, oh no, it is a1, sorry, a1 minus 2a2, and here we would have minus 3a1 plus 4a2. So this gives us a set of linear equations when we have these two things here. So we're going to have 17 is equal to, because this is the first coordinate of our vector, is equal to the first coordinate here, 2a1 plus a2. Our second coordinate, negative 4, will be equal to a1 minus 2a2. And our last coordinate, 2, will be equal to minus 3a1 plus 4a2. So this is our system of linear equations, which you can solve as you did in, I don't know, middle school when you learned how to solve system of equations. But the nice way to do it is if you've had linear algebra before, you will row reduce this matrix. So now the matrix form of this system of equations takes the coefficients in front of our variables a1 and a2, and it makes our coefficients a1 and a2 into a vector. So we'll have the coefficients in front of a1, which is 2, 1, negative 3, the coefficients in front of a2, which is 1, negative 2, 4, and then we have our unknowns, or our variables, a1 and a2. Also, you'll notice you could have read that off directly from here. You just take the first vector, you take the second vector, you do a1, a2, you equal it to the solution, right, so this is our coefficients, this is our unknown or our variable, then our solution to our equation that we want it to equal to is 17 minus 4, 2. And we talk about row reducing, then we represent this equation here with this matrix, we just drop the coefficient, the, uh, the variables, and we take our coefficient matrix and we add our solution matrix and then we do row reduction. And this matrix row reduces to the matrix 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 6, 5, 0. And 
When we row reduce, we, it means that the solution to this matrix has the same solutions to this matrix here. As for how to get from this matrix to this matrix, any textbook, well, I guess not linear algebra done right by Sheldon Axler, but most first, some first course in linear algebra will show you how to do that. I also have a video in my linear algebra in less than five hours series. The first video will show you how to do that. But once you know how to do that, I would recommend using Wolfram Alpha. They have um, a linear algebra section, and in the linear algebra section, it has a row reducer. So you plug in your matrix row by row. So the 2, 1, 17, my 1, negative 2, negative 4, and my negative 3, 4, 2. If you forget, if it, you plug in column by column versus row by row, don't worry, because once you input the row, it'll show you the matrix it's trying to row reduce. So here I can see that it's correct. And then it'll show you the result which is this matrix here that I've copied here. The one, uh, the first column being 1, 0, 0, the second column 0, 1, 0, and the last column 6, 5, 0. Now we convert this back to a system of equations. So here are our coefficients. We have our variable, and then our solution over here is 6, 5, 0. When we read this off, we get um, A2 is equal to 5, and A1 is equal to 6. So this will be our solution over here for A1, we plug in 6, A2 is equal to 5. So you can check that by plugging in 6 and 5 here. You'll see that it solves this uh, equation, which means that 7, negative 4, 2 is a linear combination of the two vectors, 2, 1, negative 3, and 1, negative 2, 4. In our last example, we found 17 minus 4, there was a 2 here, and we found it was a linear combination of these two vectors. But now we're going to replace this 2, the last coordinate, with a 5. So the question is, is 17 minus 4, 5, a linear combination of the vectors 2, 1, negative 3, and 1, negative 2, 4? So in other words, can we multiply 2, 1, negative 3 times a scalar in this for this example, for whatever reason, I decided to use x's as my variables as opposed to a's. So x1 times 2, 1, negative 3, plus x2 times 1, negative 2, 4, and set that equal to 17 minus 4, 5. Getting our coefficient matrix then, we have our first vector, our second vector, our variable is equal to our solution vector, which means the matrix we're going to work with is 2, 1, negative 3, the next column will be 1, negative 2, 4, and the final column is 17, negative 4, 5. We're going to row reduce, and we're going to get the identity matrix, the one with vectors or columns 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. So putting this back to a vector equation form, we have our coefficient matrix, our x1, x2, equals our new solution matrix 0, 0, 1. Remember, these two, when we row reduce, we get an equivalent system of equations, but this is going to represent our new system of equations that has the same solutions as our old system of equations. Now that's equal to x1, x2, and then we have our solution 0, 0, 1. So when we multiply this out, first column times our first row times our column, we get x1 is equal to 0. The second row times our column, we get x2 is equal to 0, but this third row times our column gives us 0 times x1 plus 0 times x2 is equal to 1. And of course, this is impossible. There's no x1 and x2, which will make 0 equal to 1. So this system of equations is inconsistent, or the system of equations represented by this matrix is inconsistent, has no solution, and therefore 17 minus 4, 5 is not a linear combination of 2, 1, negative 3, and 1, negative 2, 4. The next concept to review is span. The set of all linear combinations of a list of vectors in a vector space V is called the span of the vectors. So span of a set of vectors is equal to the linear combinations, that is, scalar A1 times vector V1, scalar A2 times vector V2, up to scalar AM times vector VM. The span, then, of two, these two vectors that we used in our previous example, 2, 1, negative 3, 1, negative 2, 4, are vectors, they're all the vectors, all possible vectors that have this form. A1, a scalar, times 2, 1, negative 3, plus A2, times 
1, negative 2, 4. And again, these scalars a1 and a2, all possibilities, including 0 and 1. From our linear combination example, we saw that the vector 17 minus 4, 2 is equal to 6 times 2, 1, negative 3, plus 5, 1, negative 2, 4. So since 17 minus 4, 2 can be written as a linear combination of the vectors 2, 1, negative 3, and 1, negative 2, 4. We say that 17 minus 4, 2 is in the span of the two vectors. Our linear independence example also showed us that the vector 17 minus 4, 5 is not a linear combination of 2, 1, negative 3, 1, negative 2, 4. In other words, the vector 17 minus 4, 5. If we try to put this in the form of a1 times 2, 1, negative 3 plus a2, 1, negative 2, 4, we could not find any values a1 and a2 that would satisfy this condition. So 17 minus 4, 5 is not in the span of 2, 1, negative 3, 1, negative 2, 4. Now that we have reviewed linear combinations in span, we're ready to move on to linear independence and linear dependence. So a list of vectors in a vector space V is called linearly independent if the only solution to the homogeneous equation, and by homogeneous we mean it's equal to zero. So we have the equation scalar a1 times v1 plus scalar a2 times vector v2 up to scalar am times vector vm is equal to the zero vector. If the only so, so the set of vectors is linearly independent if the only solution to the homogeneous equation is the trivial solution. The trivial solution being when a1, a2 up to am are all equal to zero. I've moved my definition up here for reference as well as the definition of linearly dependent, which means it's not linearly independent. The first example I have is to show the vectors 2, 3, 1, 1, minus 1, 2, and 7, 3, 8 are linearly dependent. That will mean there is a non-trivial solution to this homogeneous equation. I start by setting up my homogeneous equation. I have my scalar a1 times my first vector, 2, 3, 1, my a2 times my second vector, 1, negative 1, 2, and a3 times my third vector, 7, 3, 8, and we set that equal to the zero vector. And we know this represents this system of equations here. So if you just multiply all this out, all the scalars times the vectors, and then multiply the three resulting vectors, you'll get this, three, this system of linear equations. The matrix then I'm going to use, I'm just going to take the first vector, 2, 3, 1, the second vector, 1, negative 1, 2, and the third vector, 7, 3, 0, add the solution vector, 0, 0, 0, and I'm going to row reduce using something like well, actually, I don't have an uh, internet connection here, so I did the row reduction by hand. So now, the system of equations represented by this matrix has the same set of solution as the system of equations represented by this matrix here. I'm actually going to add one more step, so I'm going to move this part over here. So I can add one more step here where I rewrite this matrix in vector form. So writing this in vector form, I'm going to get my coefficient matrix. My stylus doesn't want to point here. My coefficient matrix, I move over here. My variables then is a1, a2, a3. And then my 0, 0, 0 gets moved over here as my solution to my equation. So then multiplying this row times this column, well, actually, let's start at the bottom. We get that a3 is free because we have 0 times a3 is equal to zero. So a3 can be anything because, you know, whatever it is, zero times a3 is going to give you zero. From this uh, row times this column, we are going to get a2 is plus a3 is equal to zero. In other words, a2 is equal to minus three a3. From this row times this column, we get a1 plus two a2 plus 8a3 is equal to 0. So in other words, we're going to get a1 is equal to minus 2a3. So a3 can be anything. So actually there are infinite, an infinite number of solutions that can solve this equation because there are an infinite number of ways you can choose a3.
So I'm going to choose a3 is equal to 1 because that's the simplest thing because then all I have to do for a2 is multiply minus 3 times 1, which is minus 3, and a1 will then become 2. One of the nice things about this linear algebra is you can check your solution now. So if a1 is equal to negative 2 times our first vector 2, 3, 1, a2 is equal to negative 3 times our second vector 1, negative 1, 2, and then a1 is equal to 1 times our third vector is 7, 3, 8. And when I do my multiplication, negative 2 times 2 is negative 4, um, plus minus, minus 3 times 1, that will be minus 3. So I have a minus 7 plus 7 is 0. I have negative 2 times 3, that's minus 6, plus 3, yeah, that would be a plus 3, plus another 3 will give me 0. I have a negative 2 times negative 6 that gives me, or plus negative 6 that gives me a negative 8, plus 8 gives me 0. So you can see by definition of linearly independent, there's a non-zero solution, which is a1 is equal to negative 2, a2 is equal to negative 3, and a3 is equal to 1. There's a non-zero solution, and therefore it is not linearly independent, meaning it is literally linearly dependent. I moved some of this work up because I wanted to say one more thing. So when you have linearly dependent vectors, you can solve for any one of these vectors now in terms of a linear combination of the other. So I just chose the vector, the first vector, 2, 3, 1. I can move these vectors to the other side of the equation by adding 3 Oh, there should have been a 3 over here. 3 times 1, negative 1, 2, and then subtracting 7, 3, 8. And then, of course, well, not of course, but then to get rid of this 1 half here, I divide both sides of the equation by negative 1 half. So now I have 2, 3, 1 as a linear combination of these two vectors. In particular, the linear combination is this minus 3 half times the first vector plus 1 half times the second vector, and we can check our work. So 2 is equal to minus 3 halves plus 7 halves. Yeah, that would be 4 halves, so then divided by 2 would give us 2. Our 3 is our positive 3 halves plus another 3 halves, so that gives us 3. And then our 1 is equal to our minus 3 plus 4, that gives us our 1. So again, when you have linearly dependent vectors, you can write any one of the vectors as a linear combination of the others. And I just chose one here, but you could do the same for 1, negative 1, 2, or 7, 3, 8. It helps me remember which is linearly dependent and which is linearly independent by remembering if it's linearly dependent, you can think of this vector as being dependent on these other two. In other words, you can construct this vector out of the other two. If they're independent, then this vector would have nothing in common. It would have no elements of the other two vectors, so that it's independent. Our next example, let's say we have two vectors, v1, v2. We're looking to see if they're linearly independent or linearly dependent. So we have the equation scalar a1 times vector v1 plus scalar a2 times vector v2 equals 0. So if there's a non-zero trivial solution, so if they are dependent, then we can write av1 equals minus av2, then we can divide both sides by a1 to get v1 equals minus a2 over a1 v2. Which means if we have two vectors that are linearly dependent, in other words, there's an a1 a2 not equal to 0, and that's important because we're going to divide by a1 or a2. That means v1 now is a scalar multiple of v2. So if the homogeneous equation with two vectors, a v1 plus a v2 equals 0, has non-trivial solution, in other words, if they're linearly dependent, the vectors are scalar multiples of each other. And if we had three or more vectors, and we will illustrate this with three vectors, so we have a1, v1, plus a2, v2, plus a3, v3, looking at the homogeneous equation. If there's a non-trivial solution, again, we're talking about linearly dependent. Maybe I should box that. We're talking about linearly dependent vectors. 
So if there are three or more, then we can solve for a1 in terms of the other two vectors, just like we did in our previous example. So for linearly dependent vectors, one vector can be written in terms of the other as a linear combination. Your book now gives a list of examples of linearly independent vectors. The first one is a list v of one vector. It's linearly independent if v is not equal to zero. We can see that because if we write our homogeneous equation, that'll give us a1 times v1 equals zero. Well, if v1 is not equal to zero, that must mean that a1 is equal to zero. That's the only solution if v1 is not equal to zero. So therefore, it's linearly independent because only the trivial solution for this equation. For the next example, I have a list of two vectors is linearly independent if and only if neither is a scalar multiple of each other. In other words, it's linearly independent if they are not scalar multiples. This is very similar to the previous example we did, but we'll do a formal proof of this now. The if and only if here in the statement means there are two directions to the proof. We'll do the forward direction, meaning we'll first prove that linearly independent implies uh, neither is a scalar multiple of the other. So we're going to assume we have v1 and v2. They are linearly independent. So that means our, um, our a1 v1 plus a2 v2 equals 0 has only the trivial solution where a1 and a2 are equal to 0. From this equation, we can write a v1 is equal to minus a v2, but we can't go any further. We can't express either as a multiple of the other because if we did the division by a1 to solve for v1 in terms of, I'm sorry, to v, and I put v2 on both sides of the equation. This should be v2, this should be 2, v2. So if we divide by a1 on both sides of the equation to get v1 is equal to negative a2 over a1 v2, we would have this division by 0 because the only solution to this equation was a1 and and a2 is equal to 0. Similarly, if we solve for v2 by then dividing both sides of the equation by a2, minus a2, we would get v2 is equal to negative a1, a2 times v1, except that now we have the division by 0 again because both a1 and a2 are equal to 0. So we can't do this last step of expressing one vector as a scalar multiple of the other. And you know, I was looking at this, this over here almost looks like the y intersects my equal side, so it almost looks like I'm trying to say that it's not equal to zero, but actually it should be it's equal to zero. Now we will look at the other direction of the proof. We'll assume that neither is a scalar multiple of each other and show that they're linearly independent. And we're going to do this sort of with a proof by contradiction because we're going to assume the opposite, that v1 is a scalar multiple of v2. So then we can write v1 is equal to some scalar times v2. But now if we subtract a v2 from both sides of the equation, we get v1 minus a v2 equals 0, which means there's a non-trivial solution where v, you know, a1 is, or the, the scalar in front of v1 is 1, and the scalar in front of v2 is equal to minus a, that equals 0. So that means v1 and v2 are not linearly independent. So the only way v1 and v2 are scalar multiples is if they're not linearly independent. So that finishes our proof. The next example are the e1, e2, e3, and e4 vectors. If you remember from our last video, we said e1 is the vector with all zeros except in the first position. e2 is the vector with all zeros except in the second position. e3 is all zeros except in the third position. So e sub i vector is the vector with all zeros except in the ith position. So now I write my homogeneous equation, my a1 times e1 plus a2 times e2 plus a3 times e3 plus a4 times e4, and I set it equal to my zero vector, multiplying my scalars times my vectors, and then adding together, I'm going to get a1, a2, a3, a4 is equal to my zero vector, which implies a1 is equal to zero, a2 is equal to zero, a3 is equal to zero, and a4 is equal to zero. Therefore, they are linearly independent because the only solution is the trivial solution.
Last, I had the list of 1, z, z squared up to z to the m is linearly independent in the polynomial space. To prove this, we're going to multiply each of these vectors, each of these polynomials. Remember, in the polynomial vector space, the polynomials are the vectors. So multiplying each of our vectors by a scalar. So I have a0 times 1, which is just a0, a1 times z, a2 times z squared, up to am times zm. And we set that equal to 0. The 0 polynomial is the polynomial that sets everything equal to 0. So just like from algebra, setting each of the like terms, that means a0 is equal to 0, and then a1 is equal to 0. All of them are equal to 0. And therefore, these vectors, these polynomials, 1z, z squared up to zm, are linearly independent in the space of polynomials over the field f. Our next example is to show the vectors 2, 3, 1, 1, negative 1, 2, 7, 3, c, is linearly dependent if and only if c is equal to 8. We start off by writing our homogeneous equation, so a1 times our first vector 2, 3, 1, plus a2 times our second vector 1, negative 1, 2, plus a3 times our third vector 7, 3, c, and we set that equal to our zero vector. We can think of this as representing this system of equations, these linear equations. We have 2a1 plus a2 plus 7a3 is equal to 0 is our first linear equation. Our 3a1 minus a2 plus 3a3 equals 0 is our second linear equation. a1 plus 2a2 plus c times a3 equals 0 is our third linear equation. The matrix then that represents the system of equations, we can actually just read it off from here. We take our first vector, 2, 3, 1. Our second vector, 1, negative 1, 2 our third vector, 7, 3, c, and then our solution, 0, 0, 0. You can row reduce this using Wolfram alpha, and it says that our matrix is equivalent to the matrix with vector uh, columns 1, 0, 0, column 0, 1, 0, column 2, 3, 0, and then 0, 0, 0 on the far left. And it has this note, this assumes c equals 8. So what it's saying is it only has solution when this variable c is equal to 8. And in case you wanted to see what that looks like, if you reduce, row reduce by hand, I have it done here for, by hand for your reference. But you can see this last equation now will give us that c must equal to 8. I got rid of my hand row reduction to make some room, but I did put in the matrix that Wolfram Alpha recommended, which is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 3, 0, 0, 0, 0. Also, when I row reduced by hand, I didn't go to reduced echelon form. I just went to echelon form. But if you use that echelon form matrix, it'll give you the same solutions I'm about to show you. Now we have this equivalent system of linear equations. By equivalent, I mean it has the same solutions as this system of linear equations. So this, remember this column represents a1, this column represents a2, and this column represents a3. So now I can just read it off of here. Our bottom row just says 0 times a1, 0 times a2, 0 times a3 gives us 0. Our next row tells us that a2 plus 3a3 equals 0. In other words, a2 is equal to minus 3a3. And over here, we get that a1 plus 2a3 is equal to 0. In other words, a1 is equal to minus 2a3. So I'm going to let a3 equals 1. So a3 is our free variable. So there are actually an infinite number of solutions because every time you choose a value for a3, you get a new set of a3, a2, and a1. But a3 is free. I'm going to choose the easiest one, which is a3 equals 1, so that a2 now is equal to minus 3, and a1 is equal to negative 2. So this is a uh, non-zero solution to our homogeneous equation, meaning our set of vectors is linearly dependent. I can check my solution by plugging in negative 2 times our first vector, 2, 3, 1, where's negative 3 times our second vector, 1, negative 1, 2, and then 1 times our third vector, 1, 3, and then remember c is equal to 8, 
you can see uh, negative 2 times 2 is negative 4, minus 3 is, so now we have minus 7 plus 7 is 0. I feel like I've done this before. Then we have this minus 2 times 3 minus 6. We have a plus, plus 3, another plus 3, so that's 0 with the minus 6. We have minus 2 minus 6, that's minus 8, plus 8 is 0. And remember, when they're linearly dependent, that means you can choose one of these vectors. I chose 7, 3, 8 because I didn't want to divide, but really it could be any other one. And you can write it as a linear combination of the other two. So 7, 3, 8, moving this over, I get 2 times 2, 3, 1, plus 3 times 1, negative 1, 2. And again, I like to think of it as when you're dependent, that means this vector can be made from the other two vectors. In other words, it's sort of dependent, or there's a dependency, there's some commonality between them. Our next set of examples are going to be sort of proof and demonstrations. Next, we're going to show or kind of prove this note that if we have vectors v1, v2, vm, they're linearly independent if and only if each vector in the span of v1, v2 up to vm has only one representation as a linear combination of v1, v2 up to vm. So first, we're going to do this by um, contradiction. So we're going to assume we have two representations of v that's in the span of v1, v2 up to vm. So let's let v equal a1, v1 plus a2, v2 up to am, vm, and let's make a second representation of the same vector as equal to c1, v1 plus c2, v2 up to cm, vm. And the c1, a1 are not necessarily equal, c1, c2 are not necessarily equal up to cm, am are not necessarily equal. So two representations. Let's look what happens when we subtract one representation from the other. Actually, I should put the little vector sign on top of my v's. Okay, so let's subtract one representation from the other. So v minus v is going to be 0. Here we're going to have a1 minus c1 times v1 plus a2 plus, oh, I'm sorry, minus c2 times v2 up to am minus cm times vm. Now, if this whole representation is equal to 0, that must mean that our a1 c1 is equal to 0, which implies a1 is equal to c1, and we go down each of these vectors, right, because these theoretically are not all zero vectors, so that must mean that our coefficients must be equal, which means our two representations of v, these two representations, must be equal. Our next example is some vector in a list of vectors is a linear combination of the other, then the list is linearly dependent. So for example, let's say we have vectors v1, v2, v3, up to vn, and one of the vectors, and let's just choose v1, you know, you can reorder, re-index re them, so it's v1 is a linear combination of the other, so v1 is equal to a2 v2 plus a3 v3 plus a n v n. That means now if I subtract v1 from both sides of this equation, I get 0 equals minus 1 v1 plus a2 v2 plus a3 v3 up to a n v n. So now because we have a non-trivial solution, because at least one of the coefficients is not 0, that means our list is linearly dependent. And by our list, I mean the set or the list v1, v2, up to vn. It's linearly dependent. Sometimes my stylus is very difficult to write with because it misses things. Every list of vectors containing the zero vector is linearly dependent. Let's look at an example of the zero vector plus v1, v2 up to vn. I write my homogeneous equation a0 times zero plus a1, v1 plus a2, v2 up to a and vn. And what you see now, because of this zero vector, all of these vectors can be zero, but this a0, it can be any real number because it's multiplied by the zero vector. So a0 can be any real number. And if your field is complex, then it can be any complex number. So that means that a1, a2, up to an can be equal to zero, but you'll always have a non-zero solution because a0 can be any real, any complex number. And therefore, the list is linearly dependent because there's a non-zero solution.
Okay, now we have some other lemmas and other properties or notes. So the first lemma, suppose that v1, v2 up to vm is a linearly dependent list in the vector space v. Then there exists a jth vector such that, one, the jth vector is in the span of the other j minus 1 vectors, and two, if the jth term is removed from our list of vectors, the span of the remaining list still equals the span of the full list. I moved my lemma up here so that I have space to do a proof of the lemma as another exercise. So we're going to start with part one, that this here implies A. That is, our set of linearly dependent vectors, there'll be an, a jth vector such that the jth vector is in the span of our remaining j minus 1 vectors. In other words, the fact that these v1 through, and I'm sorry, I wrote vn here, so pretend like this is an n. The fact that the v1 through vn are linearly independent means that the equation, the homogeneous equation, has a non-trivial solution, and then what we want to show, that means the jth vector is in the span of v1, v2, up to v sub j sub i. That means for our jth vector, if it's in the span, that means our jth vector is a linear combination of the remaining v1, v2, up to v sub j minus 1 vectors. So for my proof, I just solve for j equals n over here. And actually, I'm assuming now that this vector here doesn't have a zero coefficient. If it does, you know, rearrange your vector so that the last one doesn't have a zero coefficient. So I'm going to subtract a n v n from both sides of this equation, and what I get is negative a n v n then is equal to a1 v1 plus a2 v2 up to a n minus 1 v n minus 1. Now I'm going to divide both sides of this equation by my minus a n so that I can isolate my vector v n. So v n then is equal to minus a1 over a n v1 plus minus a2 over a n v2 up to a n minus 1 over a n negative times v sub n minus 1. And since my a sub i over a n, each of these, is just a scalar, I'm just going to rename that scalar b1, b2, up to b n minus 1. And that's what I wanted to show, that this equation here, having non-trivial solution, and it's important that it's non-trivial because, as I said, we chose this Vn, we rearranged our vectors so that Vn has a non-zero, this An, that's how we could divide then everything by An here. So the fact that this had a non-trivial solution let us, allowed us then to write our V sub J, and we said that there exists a V sub J, so I just chose the Vn, such that An is not equal to zero, such that this is true, that our v sub n is a linear combination of the remaining n minus 1 vectors. Now for the proof of part b, again we are going to assume that our list of vectors is linearly independent. In other words, our homogeneous equation now has a non-trivial solution. We're going to show that the, if the uh, j vector is removed from the list, then the span of the remaining vectors is still equal to the original list. So we're going to start by saying here, we're going to assume v sub j, again, is equal to our linear combination of b1, b2, up to b sub j minus 1, v sub j minus 1. And we get this from part a that we just proved. Now the span of v1, v2, up to v sub j is equal to a1, v1, plus a2, v2, up to a sub j minus 1, v sub j minus 1, plus a sub j, and now v sub j is a linear combination of our previous j minus 1 vectors. So now we can do some algebra to combine our coefficient in front of v1. So our coefficient is going to be a sub 1 plus a sub j times b1 times v1. Our coefficient for v2 is going to be our a2 plus our b2 times aj. Our coefficient for v sub j minus 1 over here is going to be our a sub j minus 1 plus a sub j times b sub j minus 1.
But now all these coefficients, since a1 and a sub j and b1 are all scalars, when we do these little linear combinations of our scalars, we still have a scalar. So we still have the form of being in a linear combination of v1, v2 up to v sub j minus 1, which means now that the span of v1, v2 up to v sub j is equal to the span of v1, v2 up to v sub j minus 1. This makes sense if you think of, since v sub j is a linear combination of the previous v sub j minus 1 vectors, v sub j doesn't really have any new information. In other words, you know, it, it's already contained in these j minus 1 vectors. So v sub j, the span when we include v sub j, doesn't really give us any more information than the span when we don't include v sub j. Next we have the theorem in a finite dimensional vector space, the length of every linearly independent list of vectors is less than or equal to the length of every spanning list of vectors. I have the theorem up here so we have plenty of room to do a proof as an exercise. Probably even more important than the proof though is this theorem will help us do some problems really quickly and easily, but we'll start with the proof which is not that quick or easy. So we have a finite dimensional vector space, the length of every linearly independent list of vectors. So I have, I'm going to assume u, and actually this shouldn't be a vector, this is a list u. It's going to be the list of vectors u1, u2, up to um, and we're going to assume they're linearly independent. And the length of this list is m, because there are m vectors. And then we're going to compare that to the length of a spanning list of vectors. So we're going to let w be the list of vectors w1, w2, up to wn, and we're going to let that equal to the span of our vector space v. And the length of this list is n, because there are n vectors in w. So what this theorem says then, in a finite dimensional vector space, the length of every linearly independent list of vectors is less than or equal to the length of every spanning list of vectors. So that means the list, this length here, m, should be less than or equal to the length of the spanning list, so less than or equal to n. So first, well, if m is less than or equal to n, we're done. So the next case is to assume m is greater than n. I'm going to put a little plus sign here next to the u to remind me that this is the bigger set, or has the list is bigger, has more elements. So the first thing I'm going to do is add the vector u1 over here to my set w. So that's going to give me a new list. It's u1, w1, w2, up to wn. So this new list will be linearly dependent because w is equal to the span of our vector space, which means u1 can be written as a linear combination of w. So u can be written linear combination. That means it's linearly dependent. According to our lemma that we had just proven, because we have a dependent list, then there's some jth vector that we can remove and still have the remaining span. So we can remove one of the w's, a wi, to get a new list of length n that spans v. We're going to repeat this process till we get to un. That is, we're going to add now u2 to our new list, and we're going to throw out one of the w sub i's. We'll add u3, we'll throw out another w sub i, but we'll keep our list length equal to n until we finally get to un, not um, but un, which is equal to the number of w's, so that we add our u sub n, throw out one of the w's, but at this point, we've thrown out n w's. We've thrown out all the w sub i's, and we have our list u1 up to un, and we still span v. So I just wrote that out. So our new list for span of v now is u1, u2, up to un. But remember, there's still other, potentially, other vectors that we haven't added to our list. Our other vectors u sub i that we haven't added to our list because m is greater than n. Or at least that was our assumption. Remember, we're doing a proof by contradiction. So anyway, 
So let's assume then there's a vector u sub n plus 1. So it's a vector we haven't added to our list that spans v. And again, we know we're assuming there's this u sub n plus 1 vector because we assumed m was greater than n. Now, u sub n plus 1 must be in the span of v because the set spans v. But the list u was linearly independent, so we have a contradiction. We can't have u sub n plus 1 in the span of our first n vectors because we assumed over here that our m u vectors are linearly independent. So it's a contradiction, so our assumption must have been wrong. And what we have is m must be less than or equal to n. We can now use this theorem to work this example. Show the list 1, 2, 3. 4, 5, 8, 9, 6, 7, and negative 3, 2, 8 is not linearly independent in R3. Since our vectors 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 6, 7, and negative 3, 2, 8 are all in R3, and we also know that E1, E2, E3, that is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, is equal to the span of R3. I shouldn't really say equal to, but it spans R3, or the span of these three vectors equals R3. That is, any vector x in R3 can be written as a linear combination of E1, E2, E3. By the theorem above, we have a set of three vectors that span R3. So that means the list of every linearly independent set of vectors must be less than or equal to 3. So by the theorem, a list of four vectors in R3 must not be, I guess, where is it? It has to be less than or equal to 3, so these vectors are linearly dependent. And in other words, they are not linearly independent. Similarly, we can show this theorem will help us do this example to show the list 1, 2, 3, negative 5, 4, 5, 8, 3, 9, 6, 7, negative 1, does not span R4. What I have now is E1, E2, E3, E4. It's a linearly independent set. Its length is 4. By our theorem, the length of every linearly independent set, here we have one with length 4, is less than or equal to the length of every spanning set. So according to the theorem, since E1, E2, E3, E4 is linearly independent, the length of any spanning set of vectors must be greater than or equal to 4. But the length of the vectors 1, 2, 3, 5, 4, 5, 8, 3, and 9, 6, 7, negative 1 is only 3, so it cannot span R4. And that was our last example. So to review what we covered in our video when we talked about linear independence and linear dependence, the first thing we did is we reviewed the concept of linear combination. So a linear combination of a set of vectors in a vector space V are vectors of the form A1, a scalar A1 times vector V1 plus a scalar A2 times vector V2 up to a scalar AM times a vector VM. The next thing we discussed was span, the set of all linear combinations of a list of vectors V1, V2 up to VM in a vector space V is called the span of our, the vectors v1, v2 up to vm. We denote span of a set of vectors as span, and then we put in parentheses the set of vectors v1, v2 up to vm. And again, that represents all possible linear combinations of a1, v1, plus a2, v2, plus am, vm. And the main topic of this video was linear independence and linear dependence. So a list of vectors in V, a vector space V, is called linearly independent if the only solution to the homogeneous equation is the trivial solution. And if a list of vectors is linear dependent if it is not linearly independent. And our example were the vectors 2, 3, 1, 1, negative 1, 2, and 7, 3, 8. And these are linearly dependent because we can write this now in our homogeneous equation. So we have a1 times our first vector, 2, 3, 1, plus a2 times our second vector, 1, negative 1, 2, 
plus a3 times our third vector, 7, 3, 8, and set it equal to the zero vector. This is equivalent to the system of equations, which we solve with this matrix here, in this matrix form. So we have the matrix uh, consisting of our first vector, 2, 3, 1, our second vector, 1, negative 1, 2, our third vector, 7, 3, 8, and then our solution over here, 0, 0, 0. We row reduced to this matrix here. And when we do our row uh, reduction steps, this matrix here is row equivalent to this matrix here, meaning that the solutions to this system of equations represented by this matrix is the same as the solutions to the uh, system of equations represented by this original matrix. So this set, this matrix represents then this set of equations. We have 0, a1, 0, a2, 0, a3 equals 0. We have 1, a2, plus 3, a3 equals 0, which tells us that a2 is equal to minus 3, a1, and then we have a1 plus 2a2 plus 8a3 is equal to 0, which reduces to a1 is equal to minus 2a2 minus 8a3. And also, there were then no restrictions on a3, so a3 is a free variable. We choose it equal to 1 because that's the easiest, so our coefficient in front of this third vector is 1. Our coefficient in front of the second vector is minus 3 times 1, so it's minus 3. And our coefficient in front of the first vector is minus 2a2 minus 8a3, which gives us minus 2. So this is our solution, our non-trivial solution to the homogeneous equation. Since there's a non-trivial solution, that makes these vectors linearly dependent. And the thing about linearly dependent vectors, which is stated here, you can write any one of the vectors as a linear combination of the others. So I chose to write this first vector, 2, 3, 1, as a linear combination of these two vectors. So what I did is I moved my, I added 3 times v2 to both sides of the equation, and then I subtracted v3 from both sides of the equation, and then I divided both sides of the equation by 1 half. That gave me 2, 3, 1 is equal to minus 1 half, 3 times 1, negative 1, 2, minus 7, 3, 8. So you can see I can use this here, this equation, the homogeneous equation, the solution to the homogeneous equation, to write any one of these vectors, in this case 2, 3, 1, as a linear combination of the other two. We have this lemma that suppose we have vectors v1, v2 up to vm, and they're linearly dependent, then there exists a jth vector such that the jth vector is in the span of the previous or the other j minus 1 vectors. And two, if the jth vector is removed from the complete list of vectors, then the span of the remaining list with the jth vector removed equals the span of the original list with the jth vector. So in other words, this jth vector is sort of extraneous. We have this next theorem. In a finite dimensional vector space, the length of every linearly independent list of vectors is less than or equal to the length of every spanning list of vectors. We did the proof of this theorem in the main part of our video, as well as use this to do several exa or two examples. One of them is right here. So show the list 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 8, 9, 6, 7, and negative 3, 2, 8 is not linearly independent in R3. Since these vectors, these four vectors are in R3, and we have E1, E2, E3, the span of these three vectors is equal to R3, then by this theorem, then, a list of four vectors must be linearly dependent. And finally, we have the theorem, every subspace of a finite dimensional vector space is finite dimensional. So that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.